Welcome to the video for Lecture 23, Section 1. This video introduces second-order systems and the equations used to describe them. We will use an accelerometer to give a physical meaning to the second-order equations and their responses. But second-order systems are commonly generated when two first-order processes interact in series. If you think back, most of the previous processes we have discussed, including the fluid heater, the mixing tank, non-interacting liquid level depth and flow have all been first-order processes. Many real-world processes are higher-order processes. This video introduces second-order processes using a continuously recording accelerometer. We have had occasions when we produced second-order equations. The interacting tanks produce second-order expressions. We also produced a second-order response when we used proportional plus integral or PI control with a first-order process. By the end of this lecture, we will have covered second-order processes, their responses, and some of the terminology used to assess higher-order process responses. As mentioned earlier, we will be using an accelerometer as a physical model for a second-order process. The development of the second-order equations is for background information. This slide shows a simple sketch of a continuously indicating accelerometer without damping. The accelerometer has a mass attached to a spring. To simplify the problem, we will assume only vertical motion. As the acceleration acting on the mass changes, the position of the mass moves and its position on the vertical y-axis is indicated. We have two equations for force. The first one is for gravity, and the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. The second force equation is for the spring, and the force equals the spring constant k times the position y. If we equate the two equations and solve for a, we get a equals k times y over m. This equation is idealized and does not have any damping. This is not a practical accelerometer because without damping or friction, the mass would continue to move indefinitely due to an initial change in acceleration. This sketch shows an accelerometer with a dash pot. The dash pot is like a shock absorber on a car that dampens the bouncing a car does after going over a bump in the road. The dash pot is the bar attached to the bottom of the mass. This bar slides up and down between the vertical sides as the mass moves vertically. As the dash pot moves, it dissipates energy and gets rid of the indefinite oscillations of the accelerometer without damping. The equation shown is a force balance of a damped force vibration system. F is the forcing function that causes acceleration. M times G is the gravitational force on the mass. The spring constant K times the mass displacement Y steady state minus Y is the spring force and C times dy over dt is the viscous damping of the dash pot. The term on the right side of the equal sign is the acceleration of the mass. The mass times the second derivative of the position with respect to time. During steady state conditions, m times g equals k times y subscript s, the steady state position in the vertical direction. After reorganizing, we get the second order differential equation shown. We can rewrite the second order differential equation in a general form using two new terms, tau and delta, when we divide both sides of the differential equation by k and define the terms as shown at the bottom of the slide. Tau squared is the accelerometer mass m divided by the spring constant k. The term 2 times delta times tau is equal to c over k is used to define the delta term. After substituting in for tau, we can find that delta equals the square root of c squared over 4 times m times k. And finally, we define the generalized forcing function x of t as f of t over k. These equations give a physical meaning to the terms tau and delta for our revised general second order equation. This physical meaning is only relevant to accelerometers. We will be given other second order equations for processes that will not have terms corresponding to m, k, or c. Now we can take the Laplace transform of our second order differential equation as we did in section 5. And we can separate out the term y of s on the next slide, we will write the expression as a transfer function y of s over x of s. Here is the second order expression in the Laplace domain as a transfer function y over x. 
If the equation is describing an accelerometer, the terms tau and delta have their relations to m, k, and c as given. From now on, we will not be relating tau and delta to other coefficients. We use the accelerometer to give the equation some physical meaning. We will be working with other second-order equations where tau and delta are related to other physical conditions. One big thing to note in the second-order transfer function is that the last coefficient of the denominator must be a 1. That last denominator term cannot be any other constant. It must be a 1 for the following analysis to be applicable. So if you have a problem where the last term is not a 1, let's say it is a 9, you need to divide the numerator and denominator by 1 over 9. So let's assume that we have a second order process given by 1 over tau squared times s squared plus 2 times delta times tau times s plus 1. And let's assume that the input function x of s is given by 1 over s. That input function corresponds to a unit step change which is given by equation 5 in the Laplace transform table in section 5 of the course packet. We can find the roots of the expression using the quadratic equation. The method is mentioned in section 6 of the course packet. You won't need to use this method. This is the classic way to develop these equations because we will look at the quadratic terms to understand the relations between delta and the different responses. So at the bottom of the slide is the Laplace domain expression for y given by a second order transfer function and a unit step change input. The roots s1 and s2 for the transfer function can be described by two quadratic terms. The roots can be either real or complex depending upon the value of delta. So y of t in the time domain depends on the value of delta. We will look at three cases. The first case is when delta is between 0 and 1. The second case is when delta equals 1, and the third case is when delta is greater than 1. The point is that the characteristic response of y of t for a second order process in response to a unit step change depends on the value of delta. The other coefficients will also affect the response shape, but the key response characteristic depends on delta. Here is the first case when delta is between 0 and 1. This case is called the underdamped response. The equation for y of t is given here. If we apply the final value theorem, we find that y of t approaches 1 as t approaches infinity. This slide shows a plot of y of t for the underdamped case for a second order process in response to a unit step change input. An underdamped response overshoots the final value and commonly has multiple oscillations around the final long-term value, which is 1. A well-behaved response like the one shown will settle down fairly quickly. Well-behaved underdamped responses are good responses. This figure shows the typical response of an underdamped second-order process to a unit step change in the input, and the response is called underdamped when delta is between 0 and 1. Now let's look at case 2 when delta equals 1. This response is called the critically damped response. The time dependent equation for y of t for the critically damped case when delta equals 1 is shown here. Again, as t approaches infinity, the value of y approaches 1. This is a plot of the critically damped response of a second order process to a unit step change delta equals 1. A critically damped response does not have any overshoot, so it does not oscillate like the underdamped response. The critically damped response is characterized as the response that reaches the long-term response the fastest without any overshoot over 1 or any oscillations around 1. The third case is when delta is greater than 1. This case is called the overdamped response. The equation for the overdamped response for a second order process subjected to a unit step change is shown here. The overdamped response will not have any overshoot or oscillations like the underdamped response. However, it takes more time or is slower reaching the final value compared to the critically damped response. Overdamped responses are commonly called sluggish. This slide shows the three second order process responses to a unit step change input. They all have long-term responses that reach 1. 
The response with overshoot and oscillations is the underdamped response. The fastest response without any overshoot is the critically damped response and the slowest response is the overdamped response. These characteristic responses depend on the value of delta. Other coefficients will affect the magnitude of the overshoot of an underdamped response or the sluggishness of an overdamped response. The previous development was for a unit step change. If the step change is some constant value a, the results will be the previous equations multiplied by the step change constant a. This is an application of equation 3 in the Laplace transformation table. The graphs will look the same as long as the deltas are the same. The long-term value, however, will be a. So if you have a second-order process and it is subjected to a unit step change input, you will get the equation shown. There are three general responses and they depend on the value of delta. If delta is between 0 and 1, the response is underdamped. If delta equals 1, the response is critically damped. And if delta is greater than 1, the response is overdamped. We will normally use MATLAB to solve second order and higher order problems. To use MATLAB, we will multiply out the numerator and denominator to produce two polynomials so that we can use the MATLAB residue command to find the coefficients and roots to write the partial fraction expansion. Here is the second order equation subjected to a unit step change where the denominator has been multiplied out to form the polynomial shown. We now have tau squared times s cubed plus 2 times delta times tau times s squared plus s plus 0. I include the 0 so that I don't forget to include it in the residue command. Here is also the MATLAB residue command to find the coefficients and polynomials for the partial fraction expansion. One thing to note is that for us to be able to talk about a second order process being under damped, critically damped, or over damped based on delta, the coefficient associated with the s term must be a 1. It is no longer the last term because we have multiplied through by the step change 1 over s. This brings me to the end of the lecture 23 section 1 video. Write down any questions you have and bring them up in class.